Welcome to our first home homeowners seminar here at our, our Finba seminar room. And um, my name is Ronald Chan, and I'm the chief operations officer here at Finba. And just a little bit of housekeeping to get started: the uh, the, the male restrooms are up this room to the left, and uh, the females are on the corridor uh, down that way. Uh, stay on a little bit on further because we have some drinks and and some snacks uh, after the, the event. So just to give you a bit of feedback on, on Finbar, um, we're the WA's largest apartment developer. We've been uh, in around WA only since 1995. As you can see from the aerial shot there with the call-outs of all the uh, names, those are our projects here in WA alone. Uh, just in East Perth, we've uh, delivered about 2,500 apartments. So uh, we've seen the upbringing of the apartment market here in East Perth alone. And if you see a lot of the apartments along Terrace Road, uh, that's, a, that's a lot of our projects. And in fact, this building here, which you are in here today, is also one of our developments. Um, on the go at the moment, we've, have, we've got five projects on the go, of which four are under construction uh, in locations in South Perth, uh, East Perth, uh, Palmyra, uh, which I will run through uh, in, a, in a few minutes uh, with Robin Schneider, who will be speaking. Uh, on with you, you will notice uh, you have a, uh, some gift bags uh, with some, some items in there. Uh, and in addition, we also published our uh, first home owner's uh, manual, uh, which you can see in your, in your pack. Uh, there's some good items in there that brings up, uh, you know, items such as deposit savings and all that, things that uh, you may not be aware of. Um, so this evening we've got uh, quite a few people to speak. Um, obviously this is a first home owner cinema, cinema. so uh, we have first off David Crest from Urbis. You would have uh, seen him, uh, he's standing right there. You would have seen him in the newspapers and a lot of commentary uh, in, in the commercial markets. Uh, he will give uh, some feedback on uh, the Perth market and its, uh, and its spotlight. Uh, coming up next, we've got Cara Grant from, uh, she's a general manager from the Strata Community Association of WA. Uh, a lot of you may not be familiar with apartment living, um, so she'll run through what's the Strata title lot, the Strata company and so on, and, uh, and uh, if, uh, that will give you a good insight on uh, apartment living. Uh, further, Colin Lamb, uh, he's the director of Mortgage and Finance Solutions Australia. Um, He's been dealing with a lot of first home buyers and lending policies, so he's got a range of lenders, uh, so he's very experienced in that sense, and he'll, he'll give that his feedback on that. Finally, Robin Schneider, uh, who has been working with Finbar for over 25 years, uh, he's very experienced in this marketplace, very well respected, and he'll give some feedback on Parmara, uh, a, pro a product which is suitable to first home buyers. Uh, which we've seen 40% 40, 40 of first home buyers in that, in that market. And uh, just overall in all our developments, uh, just to give you an insight, uh, first home buyers make up about 20% of, uh, of our sales. So uh, this is a market that is emerging um, and to take opportunity because uh, we are at the bottom of the market and we should see the market uh, increase. So we have Cara Grant from the Strata Community Association. She would give some feedback on Strata Living uh, what's involved with Strata, um, and uh, I'll welcome him here. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Cara. I'm from Strata Community Association. As you can see here, we're the peak industry body in Strata and soon-to-be community titles in WA and across Australia. I've been in Strata now for just over seven years, and most people that I talk to when I say I work in Strata, the most common response I get is, what's that? So I've got very good at explaining in basic terms, hopefully, that's easy for everyone to understand what Strata is and how it works. It's something that we do all need to learn more about and get used to, because as David has articulated there, it's obviously becoming a much more common way of life for most of us. Those of us who have been born and raised in Perth are used to our green title houses and strata can be a bit of a foreign concept until you experience it for the first time. But as I said, we're definitely moving that way and it's important to educate yourself before you start uh, looking to move into an apartment. So what does strata titled mean? 
Here's a technical extract from the legislation which says the manner of division from time to time of a parcel into lots or into lots in common property under a strata plan. So most of us are familiar with your green title house, which means that when you purchase the property, you're buying the entire parcel of land. Strata title is when a parcel of land is taken by a developer like Finbar, for example, and they divide that parcel up into multiple lots and common property as well. So instead of buying your whole parcel of land, you're actually buying part of a parcel. So commonly we see strata title in apartment buildings, um, but also you'll see a lot of strata title around the place, which can look a lot of the time like green title properties. So little villa schemes where the owners might just share a driveway and a bit of garden out the front, duplexes, um, rear subdivisions, all of those things are often strata titled. So why are people moving into strata? Again, I think David's covered this very well um, and, and told you where the trends are heading. Uh, it certainly has a lot to do with lifestyle and location. I won't go into that in detail because I think he's covered it. Uh, the facilities, here's some examples here of some of the facilities we're starting to see in apartment developments now. You get games rooms, saunas, pools, gyms, spas, communal areas, barbecue areas, theatre rooms, all sorts of stuff. So it's really providing people uh, all of these amenities that they wouldn't otherwise be able to have in their home. Uh, it's low maintenance. You can basically shut your front door to your apartment and not have to worry about doing the gardening and all of those things that you have in your house. Security is a big one. Secure parking, secure entry to the building, particularly for people living on their own and first home buyers. My first home was actually in an apartment and uh, there's certainly um, a good feeling around coming home and knowing that you're, you know, surrounded by other people. Affordability, which David has talked about, and a sense of community as well, which is a growing trend that we're noticing. Obviously, we're living now in a technological age where we're all on our phones and iPads all the time and seem to be talking to each other less, but uh, we are starting to see that people are craving that sense of community again and want to get to know their neighbours and want to um, have those social interactions. So this is where the buildings are now starting to create these environments where owners can have and residents can have monthly sundowners or movie nights and all sorts of things. So what do you actually own when you buy a strata property? This is really important to understand um, because it is what you are purchasing and, and often it is misunderstood. So when you purchase a strata title property, you're buying a lot. So you're buying one lot of the overall parcel that I mentioned earlier. And what your lot includes can differ from one property to the next. So it's really important on any particular property that you're looking at to understand for that property specifically what exactly you're buying. So in an ordinary apartment, high-rise apartment development, usually your lot will include your apartment itself, the balcony, car bays, storage units and things like that. However, it will usually only include those air the cubic space of those areas. So as much as you own that apartment, you'll generally only own to the internal surfaces of the apartment. So essentially the airspace within the apartment. The actual building structure itself is common property, which I'll talk more on later. So that's a really important thing to remember that you don't necessarily own, you know, the windows or the wall structure surrounding the apartment. You're actually buying the internal space. And as well as owning your lot, you also own an undivided share in the common property. So the common property, as I mentioned, can include and often does include in high-rise apartment buildings the actual building structure as well as all of the common areas. So lifts, walkways, foyers, common facilities, your pools, gyms, spas, um, anything basically that's not included in someone's apartment. So what you can and can't do with your property when you buy one. So just because you may own your apartment doesn't mean that you can just do whatever you want with it. Part of living as part of a community is that you do have to be courteous and uh, respectful of the people that you're living and sharing with. So here's an example here on your left where um, someone has installed shutters on their balcony. So although those shutters are sitting within the space of what they own, they actually would need approval to be able to install that and that's because there are bylaws and legislation that actually governs how these properties are run 
and things like that where it's going to change the appearance of the building, you need to get approval for before you go ahead and do it. As you can imagine, if everybody went ahead and did whatever they want, the building would start looking very different to how it was intended. And another example here on the right is somebody changing their floor coverings from carpet to tiles. This is another thing that a lot of people move in and think, it's my apartment, I can replace the flooring if I want to. But often you'll find that there are rules around what flooring you can put down. And that's because of things like noise, for example. Um, we have had lots of cases where someone pulls up the carpet, puts tiles down, and suddenly the person below them can hear everything they're doing. So there are rules around how you use your apartment. And you're not expected to, to know them, them all in great detail, but the important thing is, is before you do anything to check with um, the experts and your, or your strata manager or real estate agent to see what you are able to do. So how is all of this managed? Obviously, when you see these big um, buildings going up and they've got lots of facilities and pools and lifts and car stackers and all sorts of things, uh, how does it all get managed? It's obviously, it's a big asset and it is a lot to manage. So there's three tiers of management that operates these buildings, the strata company, the council of owners and the strata manager. So firstly, the strata, ma uh, the strata company, which is the overarching umbrella most people, when you say strata company, assume that that's the professional company that's engaged, like a strata manager, to manage the building for you, but that's not actually the case. So the strata company is actually a form of body corporate, and all of the owners of the apartments are members of the strata company. So very similar to shareholders of a company. Basically, when you buy an apartment, you buy your lot, you buy a share of the common property, and you become a member of the strata company. So what is the strata company responsible for? The strata company is ultimately responsible for enforcing any rules and bylaws for the property and managing, maintaining and controlling the common property for the benefit of all owners. So as I mentioned before, all of the common property that exists there, pools, spas, whatever they are, or even just the building structure, the strata company is responsible to maintain. So how are decisions made? As you can imagine, often these buildings could have, say, 200 different owners in them. How do those 200 people actually work together to run a building? There are a lot of structures in place and framework to make this work. And when it's done well, it does, it does work well. Um, so all owners have the opportunity to vote at general meetings. So when you do buy a strata property, you do actually get a say. It's not a scary thing to think that this building's going to change around you and you have no, no say in that. You do actually get a vote on important things at general meetings. And then a council of owners is elected for the day-to-day -day management and decision making. So who are the council of owners? Usually it's a group of between three and seven owners in the scheme and they're elected at each annual general meeting. So every year the owners are all invited to attend either in person or by sending in their vote an annual general meeting and they all have the, the opportunity to vote at that meeting. So that's the forum for the council of owners to be elected for the coming year. And your council of owners are really like a board of directors. They're your day-to-day -day management team for the complex. So what is the council responsible for? Essentially, the council is responsible for all of the functions of the strata company. So all of the responsibilities that the strata company has to manage and control the common property, the council of owners are the management team doing that on behalf of all of the other owners. And they're also importantly responsible for providing instructions to the strata manager and they make their decisions at council meetings. So lastly, the strata manager. Who is the strata manager? Uh, the strata manager is a, just a service provider that is engaged by the owners to assist them in the management of their scheme. Obviously, as a group of owners, you're a, probably not going to know all that you need to know about strata law and what you need to do. Um, B, you're not going to have the time to do it in these large buildings. It's, it's a lot of work um, and most people are busy. Uh, so it is really important to engage a professional person who's experienced in the area to assist with that process. So the strata manager, their responsibilities can vary depending on one scheme to the next and it depends on what the owners contract them to do. So again, as a group of owners, you actually control what you want your strata manager to do and you put a contract in place with them. But generally speaking, they'll carry out all of the administrative functions. So for example... 
if the council of owners decide that they want to um, get a new gardener or replace the pool heater, they'll tell the strata manager that's what we've decided to do and the strata manager will arrange it for them. So it basically takes all of the leg work off the owner's hands. And importantly, a big part of the strata manager's role is to provide guidance to the council of owners. As I mentioned, it is, it is a big job and the legislation that sits behind it is very long and complex. And as a group of owners, um, you can't be expected to know everything that you need to know to run these buildings well. So that's where your strata manager can provide you with that guidance. And how are decisions made? The strata manager actually has no decision-making power. Uh, so they are fully reliant on the council of owners instructing them on what they want to do. Obviously, it's your asset as an owner. It's your asset and your investment. So um, the strata manager leaves those decisions with you to make about how you want that asset managed. So how is it funded? Obviously, um, everything costs money and the more facilities that you have, the more there is to maintain and pay for. So um, some of you may have heard of strata levies. When you're looking to buy any strata property, you'll see it disclosed what the strata levies are. Usually they're raised on a quarterly basis um, and they're raised in accordance with a budget that again is agreed at every annual general meeting. So once a year, all of the owners come to that meeting and they're provided with the opportunity to vote on what they want their budget to be for the complex. So again, you actually as an owner have the power to influence what your levies are. But of course, things cost what they cost. You can't decide to have a budget of $100 because you don't want to spend any money if it's going to cost $20,000 to run something. So your levies will cover the maintenance and repair of the common property, the insurance for the building, and then the administration requirements. And strata levies can be a bit off-putting for some people. They think, well, that's an extra expense that I wouldn't have if I was buying a green title house. But what you really need to think about is all of the costs that you do have when you own a green title house. It might, may not come in the form of quarterly levies, but you still have to pay for your building insurance. You've still got all of your maintenance requirements. You've got to do the gardening. If you've got a pool, you've got to look after that clean your gutters, all of those sorts of things. So when you actually add up all those costs, generally you'll find that the strata levies are, are pretty affordable because, again, you're, you're sharing the cost with a group of owners. So you get a pool, you don't have to pay for the whole pool, you're sharing it with everyone. And lastly, unit entitlement. So you've got a budget for the complex, you've got to pay levies towards that budget, but how do you know how much you pay versus how much your neighbour pays? Or for example, you might have a one bedroom unit on the ground floor and someone else in the building has a penthouse on the 15th floor. So unit entitlement is a way of working that out. And it's determined by a valuer prior to the complex coming into existence. So the valuer will look at the value of each of the apartments and, and divvy up the unit entitlement accordingly. So generally, if you had that one bedroom unit on the ground floor, you would have a lower unit entitlement to the person in the penthouse. The unit entitlement is important because it determines, in some cases, your voting rights at meetings. It determines your share of the common property, your ownership share of the common property, and subject to any other bylaws, it will determine the proportion of the levies that you pay against the budget. So for example, if your unit entitlement is 10 of 100, then your vote makes up one tenth, you own one tenth of the common property, and your contributions or levies will make up one tenth of the overall budget. And this middle one here about the ownership of the common property, that would come into play, for example, um, and we're starting to see it more commonly now where some strata schemes are starting to get really old. The owners may not want to maintain them. There might only be five units on the block, but it's a development site now and someone could put a 20-storey tower there. The owners might decide that they want to sell that off to a developer and sell the land, and that's where the unit entitlement would come into place because that will determine how much each owner will get of that. So that's all from me. I think we'll have questions at the end if there are any. Thank you. Thanks, Cara. Uh, probably one of the most uh, important questions that's always been asked and you probably didn't touch is, uh, is pets allowed in apartments? And yes, they are. You are required approval as long as the pets is 
uh, a suitable size for apartment living. And you'll notice in, if you walk through any of our developments, you see little small pets uh, here and there. So it's very common in our buildings. Uh, up next, we have uh, Colin Lamb, who will give some insights on the, uh, the banking policies around. Uh, he deals with a lot of first home buyers, so he'll give his insights. Uh, good evening, and um, thank you very much, um, firstly, to Finbar for the invitation to speak tonight. Um, uh, it's always good, especially to see so many first home buyers um, here tonight. Um, and um, the, um, the main part of this is just to give you as, as much information as we can tonight. Um, in your packs, I've actually got, um, there's actually a, a handbook, um, which is effectively just some notes, etc. And if you want to drop down some ideas or some questions, etc., um, questions at the end. Okay, so a pretty old photo of mine, but um, basically I've been banking for banking and mortgage broking for about 20 odd years, so sort of built up a fair degree of knowledge, etc. Um, the, um, the main part of um, my job at the moment is dealing with a lot of first home buyers. Um, really enjoy dealing with first home buyers, especially um, the education piece where we're trying to educate as much as we can so that um, you know, they make some good decisions and, and uh, hopefully have some good outcomes. So what do I want to buy? So David and Cara were talking about before about apartments and these sort of things. So, you know, what is best for yourself? And obviously this is a personal choice, but, you know, whether you want to be living close to the city or near the beach or whatever like that, that all comes down to affordability. Um, what are your goals? Uh, we see a lot of first-home buyers at the moment buying into the property and then again rent the property out after 6 or 12 or 18 months. Um, so you need to understand, you know, what you're looking for. Um, are we buying established? Um, are you going to buy a new property? Um, obviously tonight we're probably trying to put you into a Finbar property at Palmyra or something like that. Um, an apartment um, and a house and land package. Um, obviously a, a house and land package at the moment, there's not too many um, house and land packages you can do in the city. So we have to venture right out and as David was saying, you know, there's only 150 kilometres of, of coastline, so where are you going to be putting these houses? So each scenario of every client is different, so it depends on what you're looking for and then you know, really about making choices for yourself and hopefully you can find the right property. So the biggest question we get all the time is how much we can actually borrow. Um, and I have this thing with um, two words, with borrowing capacity um, and buying capacity. So obviously borrowing capacity is how much you can actually borrow, it's fairly simple. Um, but a lot of you might have actually jumped already onto one of these online um, calculators and sort of put in your income and those sort of things. And a lot of the times, the borrowing capacity that you put in through there is a lot higher than what you can actually afford. We're finding at the moment the um, a client's, uh, you know, the expenses has actually been really looked at and scrutinised by the banks. So if you're going to be putting in just your income and no expenses, then that's going to give you a sort of a, a very large figure. But you've got to determine whether or not you're going to continue on with those expenses. Um, even to the points now where the banks are looking at um, accounts like or expenses like uh, Netflix, um, gym memberships, these sort of things. So if you're factoring in how much you can borrow and you're not prepared to give those sort of things up, that's actually going to limit how much, or how much you can borrow. Um, so we're here for obviously a first home buyer's seminar um, and so the first one obviously is going to be the first home buyer's grant. Um, the first time buyers grant is still kicking along. Um, it's only really mainly for um, established. Well, that's the ten thousand dollars. So first time buyers now can get up to the ten thousand dollars. That's been like that for a couple of years. But there are stamp duty concessions on established properties or established and new. Um, so does anyone have an idea about the the value of what the property can, price can be up for no stamp duty? Any takers? Four thirty. Well done. So for properties up to 430000 there's no stamp duty at all, all right? Now, that cuts out, the concession cuts out at 530000 So it works out to be about $969.60 for every $5,000 of property over four hundred and thirty. for those inclined to know that. The REBA grant, so this is actually something that probably gets forgotten a lot by a lot of first-time buyers and a lot of buyers especially. Um, it's a grant given by the government um, and it's actually up to $2,000. And it's a refund of uh, things like application fees if your bank charges one. There's things like settlement agent fees that you can get um, a refund. Um, there's also pet, uh, building and pest inspections that, the, um, that this can actually cover if, you, um, if your settlement agents and those fees don't make up to $2,000. So that's something that a lot of people get, and it's free. It's, it's, you just need to apply for it after, the, after settlement, um, and it's money for jam. 
The Super Saver, um, forgot to mention, there's actually quite a few um, flyers and brochures in the packs that it, um, they've actually made up, so have a bit of a read of that. But the Super Grant is effectively, uh, the Super Saver, sorry, is, is actually an initiative by the governments to actually try and encourage first home buyers to save money. So you're allowed up to $15,000 per year to contribute into your super, and that can actually be salary sacrificed as well. So have a bit of a read of it. Again, like David, I can't give you any advice in that sort of regard, but um, have a bit of a read. Happy to take calls on that sort of stuff afterwards. Um, but um, that's a, a very good initiative by the bank. What, oh, the government, sorry. Whether it's going to kick in to help you right now, I'm not too sure, but that's, a, that's an initiative now. How much do you need to save? Um, well, that's going to depend on um, a lot of things. I'll get to postcodes and the, the LMI, the mortgage insurance a bit, but it's really about the more you save, the less you, the, or the more you can borrow effectively, um, but the more you save, the less loan you have to borrow. All right? So it's actually a good idea to try and save up as much as you possibly can, obviously. Um, the bigger one at the moment we're doing a lot of, um, which is assistance from a guarantor. So this is where I say this is um, assisted borrowing. So um, if you're in a position where you don't have, and we'll go through a couple of slides with this one as well, but if you're in a position where you don't have a deposit, or you've got a small deposit, and you've got a very nice parent, so any parents want to get rid of their kids out of their property, um, just need to go guarantor. Um, but it's a way of adding equity into the deal, right? And, and some of the benefits of it is it allows the client to, or the buyer to, to buy today. Um, it also um, removes the requirement for mortgage insurance, so there's actually no mortgage insurance whatsoever. And generally you'll get a better interest rate, better terms, etc., for your finance. So it's become an option that has actually allowed a lot of first-home buyers into property. Um, there's a few downsides, etc., um, especially if the parent wants to sell their property or those sort of things, or they feel, you know, the, the first-home buyer forgets to pay their loan repayments or whatever. So there's a few plus and minuses, and it's something that we can actually look at. So the lender's requirements are just getting harder and harder and harder at the moment. Um, there's a little Royal Commission thing that's been happening over the last six months, and there's been a fair bit of pressure on lending requirements. The banks are restricting what they can lend, um, certain areas, um, but they're being very, very mindful of um, expenses um, and making sure that um, they do look through all of the expenses. We're now having to uh, look through bank statements to make sure that if you do have a Netflix, we ask the question. If, we, if you do have these things, we have to ask, ask the question. So the requirements of the banks has actually tightened up significantly. Same as the, uh, and the lending criteria is increased, so that's actually having a negative effect sometimes on what you can borrow. Postcodes is a big one. <coughs> um, the, the banks are basically now starting to look at postcodes um, in relation to uh, how they perform, um, and so they're lending uh, less and less against those. So unfortunately, in, sort of, um, in the city areas like postcodes 6000, 6003, um, they're not looking to do lending up to 95%. Um, and, um, but even in areas that, um, like St James, as I was telling one before, there's St James which is not considered to be an apartment sort of area. Um, it's got a postcode of uh, Vic Park, I believe, and um, they're looking at doing, a, uh, some of the banks are only lending up to 90% for strata properties. So if it's an apartment or a strata, um, they're only looking at um, lending up to about 90% now. So there's all these restrictions. Um, lend to value ratio, it's actually supposed to be loan to value ratio, but um, it's actually a percentage, so I don't know why the banks call it a ratio. Um, but um, the banks normally lend up to 95%, so that means you've got a 5% deposit. The best, the best way of lending um, or borrowing money would be with a 20% deposit, um, so that actually would alleviate the lender's mortgage insurance. Um, coming to lender's mortgage insurance, um, don't be afraid of mortgage insurance. Right? This is actually a... Um, an interesting sort of um, sort of topic because it actually will give you the chance to buy the property today. So if you've only got a five or a ten percent deposit, if you look at how long it would it take you to save up the extra five or ten or fifteen percent deposit to avoid the mortgage insurance, what's happening to the value of the property? All right. So there are going to be restrictions um, on it. The bank, the the mortgage insurer, actually is the one who takes the risk. So they ultimately can look at taking um, the actual approval. Um, but they're, they're not that bad. But I've always said it for the last 20 odd years that mortgage insurance is actually a, a way of actually buying time. Um, and, but if you can avoid it, by all means, but it actually isn't something to, um, to shy away from. Interest rates. Um, with interest rates, you know, we hear it all the time. They've been the lowest 
um, they've ever been, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, where are they going? Um, as, uh, I can't give you advice on that, but I can't really see interest rates going up for some time. Um, I think the Reserve Bank is uh, going to be sitting on their hands for the next um, 12 months. Um, but internally, the banks are starting to push up their rates as well. So they are, there is this cost of funds they keep on telling us. So I think it's just a profit um, to pay for the Royal Commission. I didn't say that. Um, but at the end of the day, the rates are slowly starting to move up. But they're still cheap. They're still low. You know, they're, they're, you know we have a three-year fixed rate at the moment um, on today being the 11th of July um, at 3.79%. You know, that is just ridiculously low. So if you're, never gonna, if you're gonna be able to afford a house, it's pretty much now, or apartment boats now. Um, variable rates are, are low as well, sub 4%. Um, we've got, you know, like the choice of banks at the moment. Um, you know, mortgage brokers around town have actually got, you know, the 30, 40 banks, etc. Um, and that's to give the choice, and that's to put the pressure on the banks as well to actually make sure they are pushing their prices down and keeping the prices or the interest rates relatively low. There's, there's a couple of case studies that I've actually put in your, um, in your workbook or your bag as well, show bag. Um, and this is Claire. I don't think that's actually Claire there. Um, but Claire's basically looking at buying a property for 430000 so um, it's a brand new apartment. Um, so she's eligible for the first home buyer's grant, um, and the, um, the approximate fee is around $4,000. Um, and so she's borrowing about 408500 Now, in your, in your packs there, um, there's actually the interest rate at 3.99. It actually does tell you what the repayments are for these. So have a bit of a look through that one. Then we've got Jack and Kim, and again, I don't think that's Jack and Kim, but anyway, um, they've, they've lucky enough to actually come up with a 20% deposit. Now, they, they didn't have the, all the money themselves, so this is where I call this as assisted lending. So Jack and Kim basically come up with the 20% by way of a gift from mum and dad, um, and they've been able to alleviate the mortgage insurance. Now, on a purchase of this at about $430,000, um, they're only borrowing around about 344000 that equates to about $400 per week as a loan repayment. All right, it's, it's pretty good. This is the one, now Travis is basically um, having a guarantor. So um, he's only got $10,000. Now without his parents' support, he wouldn't have any hope. Um, having said that, um, I'll digress from this just slightly. Um, there is, there is a, another lender which most of you may have heard is Keystart. Um, now that's actually a government initiative Again, they, you can actually get into loans with only a 2% deposit and don't pay mortgage insurance. So there's some, some options in relation to that. So if you can jot that one down, I'll miss that one in this. Um, the guarantor, so this is whereby mum and dad lend you some equity in their property. Um, they, we need a mortgage over their property, um, but we split the loan off into two. Um, without getting too complicated, we actually designed the loan so that we minimise mum and dad's exposure. So on this sort of um, guarantee here for four hundred and thirty thousand, um, mum and dad really only have to guarantee seventy thousand dollars. So that seventy is registered against mum and dad's property. Um, now when we're doing this sort of structure, we speak to Travis and say, mate, you've got to try and pay off mum and dad's loan as first. So we try and smash that loan down. So um, these get reviewed every three to five years to try and remove the guarantee. Now, as I said at the start, the benefits of these: you can buy the property today. Interest rates are going to be cheaper. Um, and there's no mortgage insurance. So it's actually not a bad, not a bad way. They get some neg negative press every now and then, but um, in my opinion, it's actually one of the best ways of doing it. Now, the biggest thing is when you're going out shopping um, and actually looking for a property, um, if you haven't had a look at your finances and that sort of stuff, how do you know what you can afford to buy? Um, whenever an agent, um, one of the first questions <coughs> Robin will ask you, have you got finance approval or pre-approval? If you're going to go out shopping and you're serious about it, my suggestion is going to be to always get a pre-approval. Making sure that that pre-approval is actually being checked and verified by the bank. The banks are trying to actually remove themselves from doing pre-approvals. That actually gets verified. That's deposits, your, account, your funds in the account, etc. So that's one of the biggest things at the moment is making sure that the approval you get is actually rigid. -age. Making sure you've got that. Um, and other things in there, making sure you've got your settlement agent and those sort of things, which Robin can help you with as well. Um, time to find a property. One of the biggest things I say when I finish up with clients is actually the finance sort of side should be fairly easy. Um, and then it's a matter of just going out and falling in love. 
you know, falling in love with the property and making sure that the property you go and buy, you can see yourself walking into every day, you know, driving into that car park. And so um, always sort of say, just go out and fall in love with the property. Tell her I'll be five. Um, the, um, so just really closing, just getting a, really a budget. You know, most people should be getting a budget. If you haven't got a budget, do as I say, not as I do, but um, get a budget organised. Um, we actually have an e-book, um, and there's a lot of this information we can actually email you through. So I'm hoping we'll grab some emails, etc. If you don't get um, get one, uh, my card's in the in the actual pack, so give me an email. Um, and just saving tips, basically trying to minimise your debts. Um, when you're actually trying to actually go in for a loan, etc., keep your loans as low as they can, like your personal loans, your credit cards, all these, they do tend to work against people. Um, and as I said, making sure you get that budget sorted out. Um, that's just the info packs in our team, uh, info packs there. So if anyone does want that uh, pack, um, we'll actually email if you miss it. As I said, we'll get it to you. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Colin. So you guys know what to do. Either get rid of your Netflix, cut down on your coffee, takeaway coffees, and be nicer to your parents. <laughs> Robin. Uh, we've known Robin for 25 years. Um, in fact, when I was th 13 years old, you know, I used to go to the sales office and I used to see him. He hasn't changed. He's still bold. <laughs> <laughs> but um, have a hear from Robin because he's, he's got some good insights, good experience, uh, something that he can pass on to you. Thanks. All right. So that was all very interesting, wasn't it? But what we've really come to talk about is first home buyers. And I just wanted to ask in the crowd, how many of you are actually first home buyers? Quick, very good. Now, how many parents are here? of first home potential buyers. There's one, two, three, quite a few. So my experience is, uh, recently has been with Palmyra, but I wanted to take you back a little bit. When I was a young man, a long time ago, I bought my first home, $13,000 in Nolamara, 31 Woodchester Road, Nolamara. It doubled in price in two years. It went up from $13,000 to $26,000. I sold that property and that gave me the grub stake to get into real estate. And I've been in real estate 40 years. And when I first started selling for Finbar, it was a private company. And John Chan, uh, Ronald's father, ran that company with another gentleman. And uh, this Palmyra project reminds me very much of those very early projects that we did. And do you remember, Ronald, Moondyne Drive in Wembley? Who knows Moondyne Drive in Wembley? Behind the old Hurdy Hotel. Now, that project to this day remains the highest percentage growth property that I've ever sold. In other words, I sold those units for $95,000, $100,000. Now they're worth four fifty, five dollars $500,000. In fact, if you look through this board here, most of these projects, a lot of them I've been involved with. In fact, this whole building I sold with another gentleman from Collier. So I have many, many years' experience in, in selling real estate. But this project here we've been working on for about two to three years. It was the old egg farm site down in Palmyra. Does anybody know it? It was down in the, um, in the uh, off, off Leach Highway. So where Leach Highway runs down and Stock Road hits Leach Highway, which is, I think that's not quite right. We'll go to the next one. It's right here. So that's Leach Highway running all the way down. And there's the, the, uh, the Dorsonia Meat Factory is here. And that was a big slab of land there. Now that land there has been underutilised for many, many years. And why am I telling you all this? Because real estate's all about buying for capital growth. It's pointless buying a property, whether you're a first home buyer or an investor, unless you're going to get some kind of growth. I can't guarantee you growth, but I got very excited about this. When that client came to me and said, do you know any good developers that can build a project with us in joint venture on our site? I immediately, of course, came to Finbar. We got very excited about it because it was an opportunity to create something for what we believe was the market. And the market is first home buyers at the moment. Downsizers, yes, we can sell to them, but they're very difficult to sell to because they believe that what they've got in their homes 
they can replace in their house, in the, in, the, in the unit, and walk away with cash in their pocket, but it's a bit hard to do because some of these projects, when you're looking through the city here, those are not three, four $400,000 units. They're seven, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollar $900,000 units. And first-time buyers don't buy into those, but they do buy into this. So what we did is we created a product, a village, and we called it the Palmyra Apartment Estate because it's a village of apartments, either one, two or three bedroom units. And the key to it was to keep the price down. So we created a lovely village environment. And you can see looking at them here now, three level walk up, meaning no elevators, meaning no big levees, meaning we keep the levees down because first home buyers can't afford big levees. They can in the city, but not out here. And then we created, which is what something that we've always done with Finbar, and this has evolved over many, many years. In fact, going back to that project, we sold, I think, 200 apartments in Moondyne Drive uh, over those years. And the, what set it apart from other developers at that time was we had a gated estate with security and we had a swimming pool and a spa. And nobody else did it, but we did it. And everybody flocked to it. Now, what Finbar have done, and the others followed them, is that they created beautiful facilities. So in this particular one, we've got a lovely 25 metre swimming pool. We've also got a cabana at the back of the pool. And this is all about uh, young people and first home buyers. So you can go there, you can entertain your friends and your family. There's a hot spa. Uh, inside you've got a gymnasium and you've got a uh, sauna and also a big games room. So it creates a family environment, but it's a village environment. So selling to first home buyers isn't difficult. It's my favourite thing. Selling to downsizers is very hard. Selling to investors, even more difficult. Now, investors aren't in the marketplace at the moment, but they're just starting to come in. That's a threat to first home buyers. So I'm going to give you some warning. Whether you buy today or tomorrow off me or anybody else, you've got to realise that when investors get back into the marketplace, and they will, that will force up prices because of supply and demand. So as a first home buyer, you need to get in now. You need to be clever, you need to be smart, and you need to buy in a good location. Why is that such a good location? Going back to that first map, it's close to Fremantle, it's close to Garden City, it's close to the river, it's easy access to the city, it's close to the employment hubs. And the amount of people that I've sold to down here at Palmyra who work in uh, either the universities or in Fiona Stanley Hospital or St John of God's or down into Coburn or further down into Quinana because it's a perfect location. It doesn't have other projects all around it without getting upset with Ronald over here because there's a lot of apartment projects that, that Finbar are doing but a lot of them are in precincts where there's a lot of apartments. Just look outside the window. Apartments everywhere. Palmyra, what I, why I got so excited about it was it's an opportunity to build a village of over 250 apartments when it's finished, but that's it. There's no more big land. There's no more opportunities for other developers to come in and build more apartments. It's built up. So that gives you an, op an opportunity for growth. So the market is poised for growth in my view. My first house jumped twice, well doubled in two years. We're not predicting that. But by buying off the plan, if you came to see me, the first thing I'd do is I'd find out, have you, have you got a job? Have you got a mum and dad that's going to stand behind you to make sure that if you can't complete the contract, you're going to have mum and dad and the support of the family behind you? Very important. Then I'll send you off to see my friend Colin Lamb. And Colin, of course, has dealt with me for many, many years. I won't sign up a first home buyer unless I'm sure that he's comfortable and they're comfortable to buy. The other good thing about buying from myself and from Finbar is you know it's going to get built. Now a lot of first home buyers go out there, they think this is exciting, they find something off the plan, they'll go and see a salesperson, there's just a sales hut there, there's nothing much happening but they're told with a surety from a salesman, it's going to happen. They sign up, they pay their 10% deposit and a year later it's not built and another year later it's still not built and then they go to the developer or to the agent and they say, what's going to happen? Oh, look, we couldn't get our pre-sales, so therefore we can't start, so I'm sorry. You're not going to lose any money. You'll get your deposit back, but that's not what they want. What they want is a house. 
They want capital growth. So here's an opportunity to buy in this project, which has already started construction. It's underway. It'll be finished by May or June of next year. And the biggest question everybody says to me is, well, how much do you think it's going to be worth when it's finished? Well, I don't know. And if I was to say to you that I knew, I'd be telling a lie. I can't predict the future. But all the indices are there, as um, David has shown you, as Colin uh, would have shown you. The, the interest rates are low. Employment is good. Things are all moving in the right direction. We've had a very flat market for about eight to ten years. So if you're a clever first-home buyer, buy in a good location, in a great project, buy it from a reputable builder and developer under construction, and then hopefully in 12 months' time when it comes time to pay for it, you'll have some equity growth in it. I can't guarantee that, but my instincts are telling me the next 12 months and this particular project is going to go very well. So much so that David will tell you from Urbis, Palmyra Apartment Estate is the highest selling, fastest selling off the plan project in Perth in the, last, in the first quarter of this year. And I made those sales myself. And the 80% of the sales that I've made there are all first home buyers, mainly from the area, mums and dads, Winthrop, Burragoon, even through to Kubala, uh, uh, even right down into Munster. They're all coming from that area because they love the area, they've grown up in the area and they don't want to leave the area. This is a great opportunity to buy. So my strongest recommendation is if you're interested, come and see me afterwards and I'll help you out. Thanks, Ronald. We will be hosting uh, further seminars on a monthly basis, so keep your emails uh, uh, open. Uh, don't don't uh, all your junk mail, you know. Um, so uh, let's finish up, and th there's some food at the back and some drinks. Uh, come along, have a chat to me or the guys here, uh, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thank you.